Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Today we have lots of questions and lots of answers about all sorts of things. Fruit trees, hydrangeas, peppers, and more. It's the Q&A show next on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Today we're going to spend the whole time showing you the answers to questions we have received over the last few months. We did not have time to air them, so here they are. Up first is a question we get a lot about moles and voles. How do I stop moles and voles from destroying my yard? They are tunneling through the lawn and flower beds all around the house. I probably won't have any perennials blooming this spring and summer. This is Linda from Chattanooga, Tennessee. So Peter, you're first up on this. So what do you think about those mows and vows? Yeah. Well, there are different <laughs> creatures yes. and there's different ways to get rid of each of them. Okay. So for moles, probably the best thing to do is to put out a trap. Okay. Um, there are several kinds available. I will say I have never done it. Okay. Um, okay. I haven't had a mole problem. Uh, I know Mr. D uh -huh. swears uh -huh. by the scissor traps. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but moles have a long, they have a long transportation tunnel. Mm -hmm and they have little side tunnels where they go off and get the earthworms, which is what they like to eat. So you just need to identify a transportation tunnel, uh, set the trap there, you'll probably have a mole. Um, they do tunnel, they can tunnel, what, 200 feet a yeah, night or something like that. Crazy. So yeah. you may think you have lots of moles and in reality you catch one, <laughs> right. maybe two, yeah. and the problem's gone. Now voles on the other hand, okay. that's, um, that's a little harder, mm -hmm. I would say, because they are mice, they multiply like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe the best thing to do is to take the mulch away from your perennials mm -hmm. there. Um, they don't like being out in the open. All right. um, and so maybe that will scare them and they won't go out and eat <laughs> maybe. the base and the roots of your perennials, but maybe not because they do tunnel a little bit themselves. Um, you might, repellents, there are people who sell repellents. There's not a lot of data on whether or not they work. Um, at best, you're gonna have to reapply them every time it rains. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they do work, uh, you can trap them with a regular spring mouse trap. Mm -hmm. um, put that by uh, by their tunnels, by their by the tunnel entrances or where you see activity. You can bait it with peanut butter and oatmeal, kind of mash it together and stick it on there. They they like that, right. um, and it's uh, recommended that you cover the trap with maybe a small cardboard box or something. Make sure that that wire can swing freely yes, to do its yes, job. Yes. And then check it a couple times a day. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one thing I read said, check it a few times a day until you don't have any more volts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So right. they, are, they are active in, during the day and at night. So you, know, you could easily catch one overnight, reset the trap, catch one again in the day. Mm -hmm. um, then the third option is there are baits um, similar to other rodent baits, rodenticides. The only problem is, is that th the baits can be eaten by other animals or children or pets. And so you have to be very careful where and how you use it. Mm -hmm. So a recommendation is to actually sprinkle it directly into the tunnel uh, or create a bait station. You know, it could, uh, one I saw was to take a soda can open up the hole so it's about an inch and a half in diameter, dent one side, uh, I'd say the side that has the hole on it, and then put some bait inside of that and put that where you see the vole activity. Okay. So that keeps Smart. pets from being able to get into it and also provides that cover that voles really like so they can go in there and eat and, and die. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the, the wetter it is, the less the baits are gonna work. So, um, you know, if, if it's really dry, you could probably just sprinkle the bait in their tunnel and it'd be fine. If it's raining a lot, it's, that's really not gonna work. The rain's gonna wash the yeah. poison off the bait. So, but yeah, probably the uh, spring traps are the best option, spring I would traps. say. Yeah, you're gonna use those bait, baits. Look for zinc phosphide. Mm -hmm. That's the active ingredient on the baits, zinc phosphide. But one, one thing I wanna add to, moles, insectivores, moles, herbivores. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah, 
Got it. Got it. I got it. Don't yeah. eat your insect pests, right? Yeah. So they like earthworms, grubs. Grubs. Okay. They'll mess up your yard, but they're not going to eat your plants. Not going to eat your plants. Yeah. And voles have expensive tastes. Yeah. They like hostas. Yeah. Every year, my apple trees do the spring thing. Then through the <laughs> summer, the leaves got spotty, turn brown, and fall off. Now in September, they think it's spring again. I get no fruit or bad fruit. Can you tell me why and what to do? Thanks. And this is Jim Kodak, Tennessee. All right, Mr. D. So it gets the spots, right? Then That's all of a sudden right. it thinks it's spring again. So what do we think may be I, the issue? I think uh, her apple trees, this is her, isn't it? Yeah. This is... Uh, it's Jim. Jim. Okay, Jim. Yeah. Uh, my apple trees that I don't spray with a regular cover spray do exactly the same thing. <laughs> uh, a lot of plants do the same thing. When I lived down in Mobile, the pecans that went through hurricanes that were defoliated by hurricane force winds would leave out after the hurricane. And, and that's not a good thing because these plants, this time of the, or in the fall of the year, they need to be storing up energy for next year's crop. And if they are putting their energy into these new leaves, then I guarantee you it's hurting next year's crop and it's yeah. stressing the plant. Uh, simple answer is to follow a regular yeah. spray program. Use, utilize cover sprays for your apple trees. And that means spraying before bloom. I, I have ha just happened to have <laughs> just happen uh, to have, University of Tennessee <laughs> spray right. schedule here. Right. Uh, that means uh, going with a delayed dormant spray of oil emulsion plus copper. That's when the buds just begin to swell. And then at bud break, captan, a fungicide, mm -hmm. and that will help control the disease called scab. And then just before the blooms open at first pink, use captan plus malathion. Uh -huh. You can use an insecticide at that point because the blooms haven't opened. When the blooms open, streptomycin, if you've had a problem with fire blight. Mm -hmm. And then when the petals have fallen, or when most of the petals have fallen, go with a fungicide captan or immunox. Immunox, if you've had a problem with cedar apple rust, yeah. plus malathion insecticide, and then go with that same cover spray of captan or immunox plus malathion, and continue up until just before you harvest and uh, look at the product that you're using yeah. to figure out when you need to stop that. Yeah. You can use home, home orchard sprays that are pre-mixed that contain these same right. ingredients, but I would prefer to mix my own. Some of the home orchard sprays contain carbaryl mm -hmm. and carbaryl mm -hmm. will yeah. cause apples to throw their crop. Yeah, and you don't want well, to use carbaryl on apples. causes the pollinators. Yeah, the right. bees. Kind of well, right. well, you don't want to spray any insecticide while they're in bloom. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you do not put any insecticide out at, at bloom. But follow a spray schedule. Not only will it keep your fruit nice and pretty and clean and free of disease, but it will protect your leaves. Mm -hmm. Now, you harvest out, uh, depending on when you harvest the apples, after that, you're not spraying afterwards, but that's pretty much, you know, toward the end of the year anyway, and uh, it's not going to be a problem. They're going to start senescing and falling off. Wow. Okay. It's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, read and follow the label. Yeah. And we'll have that spray guide, of course, on our website That's right. for you, Mr. Jim. Um, anything you want to add to that, Doc? Yeah, one thing. Okay. You covered it very thoroughly, but no, there's did. one thing, because I had the same thing happen with my pear tree, and one of the more common foliar diseases on apples and things is apple scab, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it just totally defoliates the tree. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I have not done yet that I'm going to do is rake up all that old yeah, dead leaf because that stuff really overwinters right. right. in the old foliage and right. stuff. So rake all that up, clean up all your leaf litter. And burn it. And burn it, yeah. yeah. Don't or, put it in your compost. Right, right. right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Just destroy it somehow. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah, practice good sanitation. Right. This tree grows in my yard. It started off very small and five years later, it is huge. What kind of tree is this leaf from? Rosalind from Charleston, South Carolina. So, what tree do you think that's from? Yeah, so we look at kind of that uneven top. Uh -huh. So that's a clue, that's right? A clue. I'm kind of thinking maybe something uh, berry. What do you think? I think a berry and uh, morus species, <laughs> if you will. 
Yes, uh, Mulberry. Wings. Let's right? go Latin. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, Mulberry is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Almost a heart shaped leaf, mm -hmm. serrated leaves, of course. Um, I like mulberry. It's well, really nice. It's funny that you say that because I mean, I'm familiar with mulberry trees, but I feel like I, I probably don't. feed the birds more yeah, than I actually Yeah, because they feed the yeah, birds. I yeah, mean, that's more why I like wildlife them. species. Yeah. I don't really think I've eaten them very much, but the birds yeah. love them. I, I love them because, yeah, the birds, you know, of course, love the fruit. Uh, and it grows like crazy around this area. Yeah. It gets about, what, 40 feet tall that I've seen in some areas. Uh, but beautiful leaves can have two or three lobes. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I, there can be some variation yeah, in there yeah, I, in that leaf shape. Yeah. Absolutely love mulberry. Uh, so I think it's a, a nice tree. So mm -hmm. I would let it grow, Rosalind. Yeah. Yeah. And just be good with it. Yeah. Yeah. Feed the birds. Feed the birds. I have three mature 15-year-old limelight hydrangeas that are at least 12 feet tall. In June, I started noticing areas on each of the three plants that were shriveled up and dead. And it was as if it happened overnight. Later in the year, it seemed to have stopped, but started up again late in the summer. There are no signs of insects or powdery mildew. Any idea was killing these mature shrubs and might there be something I can do to save them? Thanks so much. And this is Rona in Nashville, Tennessee. So we have a lot going on here, mm -hmm. okay? So of course, 12 feet tall, at least 12 feet tall, 15 years or more, but overnight they start to shrivel up and die. Mm -hmm. right? But there's no signs of insect or powdery mildew. So she did know to look for you know, those right, things. Right. Right. So what are we thinking there? That's, what do you think? that's a conundrum because yeah, if they've been growing uh, in the same place tough. for 15 years and then all of a sudden, you know, they're getting this dieback, twig dieback, I would, I would actually want to ask her a lot of questions. <laughs> you know, what's changed? Has anything changed in the drainage, you know, the way the water's running across your property? Or, That'd you know, is there other things going on that's kind of changed their environment? That's, that's changed, right. you know? And if it has, one obvious thing that it could be, if it's not draining right for some reason, that, that it could be root rot problem yeah. because that's a typical sign mm -hmm. of root rot disease mm -hmm. is for a twig to die back. And uh, they are some insects that, you know, some borers that get in a twig and cause it to die, but she said she didn't see any sign, but see, you're not gonna see them. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna see this, the, the sawdust that comes out of their tiny little holes. So mm -hmm. she might have overlooked that. You know, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, you know I don't know how observant she is on the, uh, on the insect damage, but. Yeah, so I'm definitely thinking drainage, uh, but tritus blight is something that came to mind because yeah. we had wet, humid weather, and that can cause, you know, some of your blooms to just shrivel up and die. Right. Right, so, but again, that goes, you know, to drainage and things like that. Yeah. So that's We've what came wet, to mind. kind of right. wet yeah, year, we too. Did. We did. That. And of course, I remove those, you know, stems that are, you know, dead or right. dying or disease. It's always a good out. idea, especially if, if she suspects it might be some kind mm -hmm. of bore. Sure. You know, be sure and cut those out and destroy them. Sure. Anything come to mind, Mr. Day? You know, uh, one thing I thought about is maybe uh, herbicide drift, but I think mm -hmm. that would that wouldn't show up as just one limb. Yeah. That would show yeah. up uh, over the whole entire plant. I thought about. Uh, you're talking about root damage, uh, uh, root bore, but other kind of root damage. Did you, you put any drainage lines in? Did you do anything that, I mean, right. those, those roots go out further yeah. than the plant is high or, right. you know, and if you've done any dirt work, did you put in the swimming pool? Did you, did you, uh, right. did you dig any, did you put up a new fence alongside it and where you cut some of the roots or, and that right. could have caused corresponding above ground parts of the plant to die? You know, oh, that, yeah, that's yeah anything some that changes that's that point. growing mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And obviously something has changed. Right. Because if they're 12 feet tall and they've been growing 15, 15 years, years and then now she's just noticing dieback, something's changed. Something's changed. You know. Hmm. Yep. All right, Rona, we appreciate that. But yeah, yeah, go back and do a little bit more investigating. And hope uh, this helps you out, okay? Should young bell peppers be pruned? If so, where is the best place to make the cut? I've topped several young California wonder peppers last spring and the plants ended up being fuller and stronger than any I'd grown before. They also seem to be very productive, right? Thanks, and this is Brendan, Wilton, Connecticut. So, the first question, should they be pruned? And the second question, if so, where? 
Yeah, so uh, I would um, I would say that it is an option, but it is not in the option. scope of our like okay. traditional. This is how you okay. manage uh, peppers. This is an interesting question for me oh, because you know coming from a vegetable uh -huh. background, <laughs> you know I I literally just you know watch some videos to see how people were pruning peppers because it's I mean I've done it a lot in greenhouses right okay. so it okay. is a common practice in hydroponic production but we do that to manage kind of the scaffold and the main All right. All right. Um, the main limbs uh, of the plant and so really what people are doing when they're pruning is trying to increase the side shoot production and maybe shorten the plant a little bit. I've seen it done more on some of our hot peppers that tend to be kind of taller okay. and more leggy. Yeah. And so my first reaction would be um, maybe the plants are being put in the ground over mature. Maybe mm. they're a little bit tall. Maybe okay. they're a little bit leggy. I would tend to say, you know, put good young transplants in the ground and kind of let them uh, do their okay. thing. Right. Um, yeah. the, but the other element about that that I would say is it would be more likely to be effective um, and I'm not saying that it won't. I'm right, saying right. it's not really traditional practice. Okay. It would be it's an more, option. Right. Yeah, it's an, option. it's an option. It would be more right. effective if you had a longer growing season. Okay. Because anytime we um, take the main growing point out of the plant, we're encouraging it to produce side shoots, yeah. but we're delaying the productivity of that plant. So I think our, you know, our question came from from Connecticut. Yeah, so Connecticut. you know, the more northern that we get, and the shorter the growing season the more I would be concerned that you may not have enough time in that growing season for mm -hmm. the plant to produce as much vegetative and flowers mm -hmm. and fruit production as it would have if you hadn't taken the top out. Mm -hmm. So it's not just straight up productivity, it would also be a timing. Be a element. timing issue, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, don't think about, yeah, Connecticut, yeah. yeah. They don't have the yeah. long growing season but, that we have. Yeah, yeah but you know, the, you know, the scientist in me just wants to say, well, I just need to do it, you know, All I right. need to try some, but I have not grown them side by side. So, um, so, you know, it would be an option, but I wouldn't do it, you know, as a, as a reflex probably. Okay. So where would you make the cut? Yeah. So most of the time, if you're going to be taking that, you know, primary growing point out okay. of the plant, you would come down a little bit on the stem. Now make sure that you leave a few leaves because that's going to be oh, where yeah. your side shoots yeah. are going to be. So I'd make sure that you have at least, you know, two, three, four leaves that are going to be where those okay. side shoots um, are going to be. And most of the time we'd make that cut actually similar really to any pruning cut. We're going to make mm -hmm. it above a bud. Ah, so yeah, then that's like going to, you know, kind of okay. become our, our primary. Okay. So it'll grow out of there. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But again, it is an option. <laughs> yeah. Help. I have about giving up on vegetable gardening due to all the creatures. I like this. <laughs> Raccoon, deer, bear, and turtles. Yes, bear and turtles. Instead, I decided to grow creature-resistant flowers, but now the flowers are inundated with powdery mildew, echinacea, black-eyed susans, and bee balm, and measles, peonies. Is there anything I can do to control or eradicate powdery mildew in my flowers? This past fall, I did cut off and discard the leaves on the peonies, hoping to control it. This is Claire from Mount Airy, North Carolina. Yeah. So, Ms. Claire, yeah, raccoons, deer, bear, turtles. So, uh, is there anything <laughs> that she could do to control or eradicate powdery mildew, Ms. Kim? Um, powdery mildew is, um, usually sets in when we have these really warm, wet mm. nights. And um, the best thing to do for that, you can spray, but, um, once it sets in, it's kind of hard. So yeah. you want to do um, control it by spacing your plants. Mm -hmm. So there you increase the airflow. Right. Um, that's probably the best thing. Um, I've tried um, um, spraying um, like neem or something to hold that mold spores in. But as soon as you have a rain or, but those wet humid nights are yeah. what's really gets it. So it's just a problem of gardening. But I would separate the plants a little more yeah, so you get um, spacing and so you get better airflow. Okay, so good so. airflow. Uh, spacing may look at some more resistant ah, varieties yes, yes. Uh, of the bee balm. There's some out there that are newer that are more resistant to powdery mildew. Might try looking at that. Okay. Yeah, so spacing them out, allow for good airflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because humidity drives 
powder of mildew. Oh, yeah. right. right. It drives it. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to use chemicals, I mean, there are some out there. Yeah. Uh, I like cultural practices first. first. Mm -hmm. Right. That's first. Mm -hmm. All right. Chlorothionyl, we didn't follow the label, which is daconyl. Mm -hmm. Sulfur, mm -hmm. you can use. Right, we're gonna follow the label. You have to be careful with sulfur, okay? And then a copper-based fungicide. Right. Again, read and follow the label. Yeah. That's if you want to go that route. Okay. Right? But yeah, culturally, space them out, allow for good airflow, resistant varieties. Mm -hmm. All right. Not too much fertilizer. If you're gonna water, not overhead. Right. right. Water right at the root zone, right, of the plants. And Miss Claire, I think you'll be fine. All right. Hope that keeps the the bear and everything else away. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you'll be fine. Your plants will be okay. My lawn is two-thirds fescue and one-third Bermuda. I have worked hard to get my fescue to thrive, but time and time again, the Bermuda just won't go away. So I'm going to change strategies and encourage the Bermuda. How about that? How can I kill fescue in a Bermuda lawn in the winter? I have read that herbicides will not work on the 40 degrees. Can I use them during a warm spell? Amy in Western Salem, North Carolina on Facebook. So how about that? <laughs> Change strategies to encourage the Bermuda, mm -hmm. but she wants to know how can I kill fescue in a Bermuda lawn in the winter? So we're gonna start with the lawn guy first here. One of the things about fescue and Bermuda grass, those are two different types of grass. You okay. got a cool season grass and you got a warm season grass. Depending on where the fescue is located, the fescue in, in a lot of sun is not, doing, it's not gonna do well in no in a way. Okay. It do better in a lot of shade in there. And also when the, when the Bermuda grass is growing, uh, when the good mood grass is dormant, the fescue should be growing then. Then if you want to kill it out then, you want to kill it out during that time of the year when the moody grass is dormant. You might want to use some kind of herbicide on that then and try to kill it out of there, but you got to make sure, got to make sure now <laughs> the moody grass is completely, <laughs> completely dormant before you spray anything on there. Right. And try to get rid of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you so inspect it, yeah, to and make sure. To make sure right. that it's completely dormant. If not, you don't kill your Bermuda grass too. Right. And you don't want to kill Bermuda grass and you want to encourage that to grow. Right, right. Because that's what she wants to do, right? She mm -hmm. wants to encourage yeah. the Bermuda, Bermuda grass to grow. So yeah. Peter, what do you think about that? Well, I can tell you that Poa Ana, which is a uh -huh. weed here, yes. um, basically we're, it's the same situation. You're trying to kill the Poa Ana, which is growing out uh -huh. of Bermuda, which is dormant. And so I actually uh, go out and I spray Roundup on my yard. Okay. But the Bermuda's dormant. Make sure it's dormant. Because right. right. as he said, if it's not dormant, it's going to kill the Bermuda too. Right. Yeah. Especially, the other thing is make sure in the spring that your Bermuda is still dormant. Because mm -hmm. it, it might look dormant, but if you look down at the base, you might have little mm -hmm. um, you know, leaves starting to come mm -hmm. up. If you spray it then... You're gonna kill it. You don't kill it. You're gonna, yeah, yeah. It do be it do be kind of green down at the, at the root system. Right. It still be kind of it might open up and look at it. It's, mm, it still got some green in there. So you don't want to start no spraying no around on it then. Right. Yeah. Right. So be careful down so there. You definitely want to be careful. Yeah. You want to spot spray. Read and follow the label. Read and follow the label. Yeah. Any herbicide that mm -hmm. you're going to use. Right. Yeah. I was going to say on the. Um, she asked if you could do it when it was cold. Yeah. If you could. Do yeah. It when you it's could. Cold. You could spray. You can spray it when it's cold. I would wait for a warmer. A warmer day or two that you're going to have, and the fescue won't look like it was sprayed for perhaps yeah, months, possibly, but it's dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just hasn't, you know, there hasn't been enough stress on the plant to actually make it look dead. Right, exactly right. So that will be on the label, yeah. you know, as well. Yeah. So you definitely want to spray, and you can spray when you have a warm spell, which yeah. is probably what I would do under this mm -hmm. situation. So wait till you have a couple of days. You know, warm temperature, then go out right, and spray, right. then spot spray. Mm -hmm. spot spray. Again, yeah. read and follow the label on that, and you should be just fine. Be okay, yeah. How do you prevent sun scald on young fruit trees? And this is Solar Straight on YouTube, Peter. Well, I'd say, uh, well, there's a couple things. So, sun scald is thin bark trees. Right, thin bark trees. Uh, mm -hmm. So, a lot of times, younger trees, because as they get bigger, they're going to develop that thicker bark. Um, you could, if it's thin enough, you can go to the store and you use, basically get a pool noodle, <laughs> you know, and kind of just yeah, put right. that around yeah. the, it's good idea. Uh, yes, yeah, around the trunk. Right yeah. um, you could, uh, you, you can also get pipe insulation, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, it's probably easier to get in the winter than yeah, pool probably. noodles are. Okay. Um, you could also, um, there are some people who paint the, the bark and I think, I think it's a uh, quarter strength white latex paint will do it. But basically the problem is, is that it's the bark freezes, then the sun hits it, it thaws, right. and then it freezes again, and it freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws, and that kind of, that splits 
creates splits and problems, and then you get what you call sun scald yeah. out of that. So you just have to keep the bark from thawing mm -hmm. uh, if it's really it cold. Doesn't. So you know you could the white paint reflects the sunlight. Mm -hmm. The pipe insulation keeps the sunlight off it. You could wrap it. Uh, you could wrap it in some fabric. Mm -hmm. You you want to make sure though that if you wrap it in something that it doesn't stay wet all winter long. That's right. Because that'll that'll hurt the tree long term. That's right. Yeah, that'll that'll keep the sun off it, keep it from thawing, prevent sun scald. Yeah, sun scald, high light intensity, mm -hmm. right? So if you're gonna wrap those trees, which I would do, you would do that fall, winter. Right. Then summer, spring, take make sure off. you take the wrap off. Yep. Right. So you can definitely do that. And something else I'd like to add, do not use dark colored material, right? So it's yeah. more heat. That's that's the whole point. Yeah, keep the heat away. So it's more heat. <laughs> yeah. So light colored material, not dark colored material. It's something to have too when it had a drop in temperature, a certain change that might cause a little bit of too when it drop all right. of a sudden it might and do that. You might see it on there too. So yeah, the thing here, especially with young fruit trees, thin bark. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on any of the questions we answered this week, go to familyplotgarden.com. We will have all these questions listed on the home page with links to tons more information about each one. Keep sending in the questions. We love to help you make this year your best gardening year ever. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.